I had to experience the low of humility when my wife told me she was going to leave me. At a time when I had three daughters living in my dream home with my dream girl. And I realized at that time that I was living in a world of just enough for me. Founder and CEO of Man of War, Rafa Conde. David Meltzer, welcome to the Man of War podcast. It is an honor to have you on. It is an honor to be here, and I'm super excited to serve a community that obviously is aligned not only energetically, but genetically with me. Awesome, man. Love it. Love it. All right. So um, just for our audience, um, a little bit of input on who you are, just uh, getting a nice background on you. I'd love to have my guests introduce themselves. Sure. Um it's hard or difficult to introduce oneself when you live with a learned lesson of radical humility, but I'll talk in the context of the worlds that I've come from. I was born into a world of not enough, single mom, six kids, five boys and a girl who worked two jobs, packed my dinner in a paper bag. Uh, in between the jobs made us consider education the priority and family. And that served me extremely well to learn the motto of happiness that I have, which is to enjoy the consistent every day, persistent without quit pursuit of my own potential. Now, I had one problem in that world of not enough is I believed I was a victim. I believed that everything happened to me. I believed that money was the only thing missing from my life because I had extraordinary siblings and an extraordinary mom, and I felt loved. And the only time there was unhappiness in my life, although we were challenged financially, was when we were challenged financially. And so mm -hmm. I thought logically, hey, if the only times we're not happy is we're challenged financially, I'm going to be rich and I'm going to take away that and money will buy me love and it will buy me happiness. And so I moved from that world when I graduated law school to be a millionaire nine months out of law school by selling internet, even though everyone told me the internet was a fad. Justice Scalia told me nobody could do research on the internet. You needed books. I'm just giving people a time frame of 1992. I know they have the same thoughts today about crypto or blockchain. I'm just sure. telling you in 92, people thought the same way about the internet. And I <laughs> took a, a leap of faith to believe in myself to sell the internet in 92. And by 95, we sold the business for $3.4 billion. So now I lived not in the world of not enough as a victim, but I lived in this world of just enough for me. And you hear people all the time saying, the world doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. Well, I learned that that's not even good enough. There's still scarcity in a world where you're buying things to be happy, more things to be happy, different things to be happy. You're buying things you don't need to impress people you don't like. And as my career evolved from that extraordinary exit into the Silicon Valley, raising hundreds of millions of dollars, by the time in 1999, when I was turning 31 years old, mm -hmm. I was married to my dream girl from the fourth grade. I lived in a home that I dreamed of forever. I owned everything I wanted to own. And it was the first touch of emptiness in my life. It was the beginning, the red flag that maybe I was running Samsung's phone division, by the way. So even in a professional capacity, I had a greater job than I ever dreamed of. And here I was unhappy. And as I learned about the world of for me, a scarce world, a trade for everything, including giving, I would give to receive, not understanding giving is not a trade or a negotiation. I was on a journey to learn the lessons of the values that my mom taught me. I was on a mission because I had lost the values and perspective of those values. And I ended up, while I was running the most notable sports agency in the world, Lee Steinberg Sports and Entertainment, they made the movie Jerry Maguire about you, Warren Moon was my marketing partner. I had not only over a hundred million dollars in value, but I had access to what billionaires couldn't even afford to have access to. Sidelines at Super Bowls and backstage at concerts and Oscars and Emmys and Grammys. And I had to experience the low of humility when my wife told me she was going to leave me. At a time when I had three daughters living in my dream home with my dream girl. And I realized at that time that I was living in a world of just enough for me. And that if I was gonna move forward, especially to save my marriage and my life, because my wife told me, I'm leaving. 
You got to take mm-hmm. stock in who you are and what you want to become, or you're going to end up dead. And I cannot be around to watch this. You're not the man I thought you were, not the man I married. And wow. I almost, but for a jacket that my hat, dad had given me on that 30th birthday with no pockets that at that time I told him I hated him. I'm nothing like him, that he was a liar, a cheater, manipulator, overseller, back end seller. I was nothing like him. And then my best friend told me that he didn't want to be my friend anymore because who I surrounded myself and what I was doing. And now my wife tells me she's leaving me. And so in my head, the next morning, I'm like, I hate them all. I hate my mom, my dad. I hate my best friend and I hate my wife. And it clicked and God gave me a message. He showed me that jacket that I hadn't seen for six years. And I said, hold on a second. How is it that I hate the only people that are telling me the truth? How is it? I hate myself. I am a liar. I am a cheater. I am a manipulator, overseller, back end seller. And from that day, two years before I lost everything, two years before I lost over a hundred million dollars, went bankrupt. I took a journey and put faith into who I was, my values of gratitude, forgiveness, accountability, and inspiration, effective communication with something bigger than me that loved me more than my mom, an omniscient, all powerful, all knowing source, an abundant, infinite, unified system of thought that I had been interfering with since I was a child and created all of this abundance in my life. And so over the last 17 years, as I moved from being the CEO of Lee Steinberg to the CEO of Sports One Marketing to building one of the biggest personal brands of somebody over 55 years old in the world, all to provide a mission of abundance, to teach people how to make a lot of money, to help a lot of people and to be happy, to have fun in all the activities every single day. That is my journey and that's the one I'm on today. And that's why I'm here to pour into a community of men who I know is struggling with the not enough and the just enough of the world and especially the values that they can live within the context of faith to be consistent and persistent in the pursuit of their own potential. Amazing. Very powerful, without a doubt. So talk to me a little bit about I mean, the fire in your gut, right? Yes, you've been through a tremendous amount of challenges and I, I you know, your story is extremely, um, it resonates with who, who's it not going to resonate with? I mean, it's, it's an incredible story. I want to know about the fire in your gut. What gets you out of bed every morning? Yeah, for me, it's what I call faith, what others may perceive as gratitude for the future. I have faith, I have gratitude for the future in a trajectory of what I want, that I am protected and promoted. I am here to learn lessons. Life is about these lessons and pain, setbacks, failures, mistakes, even successes are indicators that I have a better place to be, a better position to be in. And it stems from what I call a best option faith. When I say that, I try to take people within the context of their own beliefs, because we're all bags of beliefs and we apply the beliefs to everything we do say, think, and feel. And I tell people, I don't care what religion, philosophy, theory, or spirituality that you have faith in. I am simply a best option faith person. So if anyone in your community can tell me something better to believe in, and what I believe in, believe it or not, is about 99% of the people, they just define it through religion, theory, philosophy, or spirituality. I believe that I am. I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. I am part of an omniscient, all-knowing, all-powerful source of energy. God, Buddha, Muhammad, Joseph Smith, whatever you believe in that loves me more than my mom. Therefore, instead of going through life thinking you need more happiness, more health, more wealth, and more worthiness, what lights my fire is I am. I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. What am I doing to interfere with it? People tell me all the time, I can't even keep up with you on the internet or on social. That's how much I see what you're doing. How do you have all that energy at your age? I will tell you, you have the exact same amount of energy as me. What are you doing to interfere with it? There's an unlimited amount of power. You have more power in your pinky. It would light up Manhattan if you literally can register it. It's mathematically proven how much power you have. Stop interfering with it. And in order to do so, 
You need to know the meaning of those lessons, the light, the love of your past, align them with the trajectory of where you want to be or better, and then practice those values and activities every day in order to effectuate the statistical success of that activity. Beautiful. Love it. Spot on. Accountability. A generation right now that we are in. And, and I do this, you know, I've coached thousands and thousands of men. You know, that's what I do. I believe I'm doing God's work. I believe that we need stronger men in our society. But accountability seems to be a word that is often overlooked and a word really that kind of rubs people the wrong way. What's your take on our day and age, how men specifically are living without this accountability? Yeah, What's happening is that it's so easy to fall below accountability and to blame, shame, and justification. See, there's three realms of accountability that are applicable to learning. Remember, I told you life's about lessons. The lessons keep on coming until we learn them. Pain, setbacks, failures, mistakes, void shortages, obstacles, and successes are the indicator that we have a better place to be only if we learn the lessons. The mm -hmm. lessons will keep on coming until we learn them. They'll repeat themselves if we haven't learned them. So accountability, counterintuitively, gives us control of our lives. See, most people go to blame, shame, justification, thinking that that has now given them the control that they're looking for, but it's actually counterintuitive. It's taken away your power. It's taken away your control. So the three aspects of accountability in order to learn the lessons faster mm -hmm. so that we can move farther and better and best in our lives is one, ask yourself, when circumstances arise, not who can I blame, how much shame do I have, and how do I justify this, but instead, how am I responsible for this happening, and what am I supposed to learn from it? Secondarily, put it to an energetic format of what did I do to attract this to myself? Am I surrounding myself with the wrong people and the wrong ideas, and what am I supposed to learn from it? And then finally, most importantly, to have that freedom and control in your life in a chaotic, uncontrollable environment, to know mm -hmm. that we ourselves, by looking within, have control through accountability. Ask ourselves, what am I doing to participate in this perception? And what am I supposed to learn from it? If we look to learn lessons through the responsibility, attraction, and perception, we can learn the lessons faster, get promoted and protected more, and see the aggregation of our efforts, behaviors. We can see exponentiality of results that appease not only us, but the others that we can give to because we can't give more with less and it will accelerate, which also appeases human nature, especially today where we get so much of instant gratification that if we don't have to wait to see the results, the better we'll be. Love it. We as a society, from my standpoint anyways, um, I don't know if you would agree with me, are falling into a trap of having a victim mentality. This mentality of the environment around me, the way that I was raised, the difficulties in my life. And that is why I am here today, not successful, not doing anything with my life. But I blame, like you mentioned a minute ago, I'm just pointing fingers at everything around me. So we get in the state of mind of, of being a victim and letting life kind of beat us down. And then we don't have that mindset anymore to continue to fight like you did and continue to grow and push through the obstacles and these difficulties and adversity in life. So my question to you here is this. First, do you agree with me about the victim mentality that you see it out there? And second part of the question is, how can men change this? I agree with you. And I think that even furthermore, beyond being victims, that most people, men and women, live their lives like tubes, food in, food out, rolling a boulder every day to the top of the hill, just to have it roll back down to the same spot every morning. And unless we say to ourselves, I am not only willing to walk through fire, but while I'm walking through the fire, be grateful I have legs. And where we need to transform this victim mentality is through a faith, a gratitude of the future, that my enjoyment is not derived by an emotional address of an outcome that I can't control, but a address for my emotions is in the desire that I must be what I can be, that I am gonna utilize my behavior to be consistent and persistent by finding the light, the love, and the lessons in all of the activities each day in a trajectory of what I think I wanna be. But my emotional address is not attached to an outcome. I will be happy when. Instead, it is I am happy enjoying the consistent, persistent pursuit of my potential. Chris Gardner, who wrote the book, 
The Pursuit of Happiness. And they did a movie with Will Smith called The Pursuit of Happiness. I told him, man, you got that wrong. He said, what are you talking about, brother? I said, it's not the pursuit of happiness. Happiness is the pursuit. And if I can shift a paradigm of victimization of things happening to you, even to things happening for you, but more importantly, in this gratitude of the future mindset of I am protected and promoted, I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy. What am I doing? What am I doing to interfere with it? I then can shift your paradigm to more than enough where everything happens through you for others. And when we get to a value add world, not a zero sum game of things happening to me, everything's a trade and negotiation. There's not enough. There's just enough. But instead, when we believe there's more than enough of everything for everyone in an abundant, infinite, unified system, then you realize that asking for help is equal to giving it. That we live in a value add world, not a zero sum game. And that not only must we appreciate everything we have, not only must we acknowledge it, and acknowledgement is acquiring the knowledge of what you have had. The only way to acquire the knowledge of what you have is not to have it anymore. So yes, Giving it away is acknowledgement, but having it lost, stolen, cheated, and manipulated from you is acknowledgement as well, as long as you acquire the knowledge. And then take the radical humility approach of asking for help. See, most men and why I wanted to come on the show, why I wanted to support you and your community is one of the things that I've realized by listening to the multi-millions of downloads from this podcast is that most men have no problem giving. Where the victimization takes place is they're afraid to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And then because they're afraid to ask for help, they go to the blame, shame, justification, the victimization in which you are illustrating so often to try to empower men so that they can have more to give more. See, inherent in the genetic makeup, the anatomical makeup of men is to what? provide. We are here to provide, but we're lost because we find that it's not humble to ask for help. They're going to think we're weak. Mm -hmm. We're going to be weak if we're vulnerable. We're going to be weak if we tell someone, man, I don't know how to do that. Can you help me? Do you know anyone that can help me? I give everyone in the world the open-ended, open-minded question template that allows us to get to the two objectives of humility, which is one, how can it be of service or value to you? Would it help you if? And two, do you know anyone that can help me? Creating this flow of appreciation, acknowledgement, and asking for more so that we can have more and give more. In fact, for your community, Rafi, and all the people out there, I would love, I will sign my book. I will send it to them. I will pay for shipping. I'll pay for the book. Just email me, david at dmeltzer.com. And I will do all of that for your community to help them understand giving, receiving, and witnessing giving, receiving will create the abundant, more than enough life that you want to live, especially as a father, a husband, or a man. Wow, that's powerful. And that's very kind of you to do that. Wow. So look, I hear you loud and clear. And you know, the, there's, you know, when I look back in my life and, and, and I look back in lives of many men who have, you know, I have sat down with and had deep conversations, that sense of um, not wanting to ask for help. You know, it's a very common thing. I, I, I hear you there. And I think that needs to change. Now we'll um, uh, touch on the emotion of happiness, right? I'm going to give you a little pushback on that. Um, in my opinion, sometimes men strive for happiness all the time to the point where it's almost like if they're not happy from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep, they've had a crappy day, right? So they have this sense of believing that happiness is just smiles and happy go, you know, being a happy go lucky guy. In my personal opinion, what I've seen true men truly feel happy in the sense of accomplishment is when they have purpose when they have meaning in their lives. So my question to you here is about that purpose and about that meaning. How do people go about finding that? Because that is a question that I get asked all the time. And to be honest, I don't have an answer. I don't have, so I'm, I'm curious and you know, you're in your thought process, how do people go and find that purpose to, to keep them happy? Yeah, so the phenomenal question and allowing me to illuminate the alignment that you and I have. So I don't even see that as pushback. I see that as clarity. And it's one of the more common issues that people are in search of their why. And what I believe is that everybody gets kicked in the face on average eight times a day. 
eight mm-hmm. times a day. And so I've actually utilized time as a dependent variable to all matter, all circumstances within the context of what I believe in a world of, of value add of more than enough. And so for me, I break it down like this. Don't search for your why, your purpose, your passion. Let's figure out what you're doing to interfere with it. Let's apply your why in a realistic, pragmatic approach. So when I get kicked in the face and I am not happy, it happens every single day day to me and to you. I have a process, a pragmatic process of one, identifying the fear that is aligned with synergistic or supplementary to getting kicked in the face. There's only two types of fear. Fear of the past, resentment and guilt, fear of the future, anxiety and worry-based fears. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to resist it, outlogic it, analyze it, go over it, under it, through it, lie to it, manipulate it, cheat it, or deny it, I identify. And when I identify the fear, I stop and I breathe. And I think about my faith. I think about the reminder. What am I reminding to the remembering What am I a member of? And the recollection, what am I a collective of, a collective consciousness? And I say to myself, I'm interfering with my potential. I'm interfering with my why. I'm interfering with my passion and purpose. I now have identified the fear that's interfering, but now what ego-based consciousness am I prescribing to that fear? Now, in its old form that Freud would talk about, am I prescribing, feeding, fighting, fleeing, or fornicating to it? But today we're more complex. We're not, you know, hunted by dinosaurs. So it's not as obvious and as clear what form of ego-based consciousness is feeding, fighting, fleeing, or fornicating coming in. But it's still an innate being. I say to myself, do I have a need to be right? Is that what's causing this anxiety? Do I have a need to be separate? Do I need have a need to be unworthy? Do I have a need to be angry or frustrated or anxious or worried? Do I have a need to be resentful or guilty? And when I can identify the ego-based prescription that I'm giving to the fear in a state of ease, now time becomes my quantitative progress towards passion, purpose, and even profitability, Rafa. So I say to myself, I have identified and prescribed I have stopped, I have dropped, breathed. Now I'm in a position in minutes and moments, not days, weeks, months, and years of being angry, not days, weeks, and months, and years of being unworthy, but instead I have now stopped, drop, and roll because my mind, my body, and my soul are on fire. And I stop, I drop, and now I can roll in the right trajectory back on track of what I want, who I can help, who can help me, how best to get it done, and reprioritize my activities in order to effectuate the trajectory of where I want to be and giving new meaning to the defining moments of my past, the failures, setbacks, mistakes, void shortages, obstacles, successes, whatever it may be, even historical relevances that I'm utilizing in order to limit my self-image. And everybody knows you'll never overachieve your own self-image. So I want you to think about applying your why by identifying fear and prescribing the ego-based consciousness and practicing it every day so that if you're one of those people like me that utilize the ego to get in my way to a point where I lost over $100 million, ruined every relationship I had, almost killed myself with drugs and alcohol to a point where now I still get kicked in the face by the exact same things, but instead of spiraling and accelerating in the wrong direction, I am now on a trajectory every day. Yes, minutes and moments, I get pissed. I got three teenage daughters. I get worried, <laughs> right? I, 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 I'm I, there, brother. And all you dads out there, don't deny the fact you're going to get kicked in the face every day. But it's how quickly can you get back to center and get back on track and do what you need to do? I appreciate it, brother, for having me here. Awesome. Awesome. Let's talk a little bit about your self-discipline because obviously you had to get yourself out of a rut and you had to apply some self-discipline because, you know, to get to where you are today and to go through what you went through, you know, there's no other way. I don't see, there's no way that you could have without that self-discipline. How important do you think it is in your life and in someone else's life? Any, anyone that's trying to bring it home with them. Yeah, well, consistency has been my superpower and my savior. And I think it's essential because I understand the actual physics of energy. See, behavior is an energy. Money is an energy. Time is an energy. Space is an energy. So I went ahead and studied energy. And here's the three characteristics of behavior of energy that makes it so powerful and why it is a cornerstone uh, to have that desire and discipline to be what you must be. 
The first is energy attracts more energy. So it builds on itself. It also creates exponentiality of outcomes. So instead of behavior giving you one today and another one tomorrow and another one the next day, you get one today, two tomorrow, four the next day, eight the next day. Hmm. And it also appeases, as I told you, human nature, because it accelerates the outcome. You see, most people can't stay consistent because of one thing. The awareness of the outcome aligned with the behavior that we create. So when we have good behaviors, like when we eat right, we expect to lose weight the next day. And so we quit True. because the results don't come fast enough. But I will tell you, it's guaranteed. There's an instant gratification in good behavior. It's called good progress. And progress aggregates, compounds exponentially and accelerates. Here's the bigger danger though, Rafa, which you know and I know. Bad behavior, like smoking and drinking and drugs and getting mad, all the bad behaviors that we have, we don't expect a bad result. And because of the nature of energy, we don't see the bad progress till it's too late. So we both had friends, I'm sure, that have bad behaviors and we see them after 20 years in those bad behaviors. They're like, dude, I'm fine. Two weeks later, they're dead, divorced, depressed, suicidal, whatever it is. That didn't happen overnight. And the other does business success, by the way. It doesn't happen overnight. It's the aggregation, compounding of the outcomes and the acceleration that creates those terrific or horrible experiences because of the behaviors that we do every day. So for me, discipline and consistency is everything. And I'll give you the last thing and then I'm gonna have to go. Here's a great piece of advice. If you are loving what you do, it will tell you some of its secrets. So if you find the light, the love, and the lessons in, in the activities, good and bad, it will tell you its secrets. But if you're consistent in doing so, it's gonna tell you more secrets. And the longer you do it, it eventually will tell you all its secrets. It'll give you all the cheat codes. If you wonder how people can get so much done, how simple it is for them, or all the things that we do in a comparative analysis, it's simple. They are enjoying, they're finding light, love, and lessons in a consistent manner for a long enough time to find all the cheat codes. Look, I don't know how to play Fortnite, but if they gave me all the cheat codes, I beat everybody at Fortnite. That's what I've been able to do with my life. I've awesome, gotten the man. cheat codes by being consistent and persistent, enjoying that, finding the light, the love, and the lessons in the pursuit of what I think I want or better. Awesome. And that's what I'm here, hopefully, to inspire you and others in your community. Hopefully, they'll reach out to me for help, david at dmeltzer.com. I'm happy to come back, man. You are doing this awesome. God's work, and I appreciate you. Thank you very much for being on, man. We'll put all the uh, show notes to your books and, and to your uh, website and all that good stuff. May God bless you, man. Thank you for being on. Thank you, Rob. I'll see you soon. You got it. Take it easy. Take it easy.